Chapter 41 Under the Hornbeam The salt fell along the cracks between their fingers, sliding down the hornbeam's bark. The crescent moon's silvery light illuminated the house of Cardell that night. Three people were standing around the gigantic hornbeam in the yard, covered in tight clothes. They huddled around the tree, torches in hand. A short while later, a weird crack split the bark, and it expanded quickly, slowly starting to look like an open eye. Eventually, the crack stretched itself along the edge, forming an elliptical hole near the ground. When Roy shone his torch inside, he saw an incline extending downward. It was filled with vines, leaves, branches, and dirt. There was also the stench of soil coming out of the hole. So what next? Roy turned to the ladies in pink coats. He was wearing a pink coat too, which was funny, but he had no choice. There were only two women in the school. It was already gracious of them to share a coat with him. There were also Letho's reminders that he had to follow. Since nobody has any idea, I'll do it, Roy said solemnly. We can't all go down. One of us must stay outside to sprinkle the salt around the tree in case that thing in there comes out, and I must go down there. Roy took a deep breath. He had a great weapon in his inventory space, and if he followed Letho's notes, he had a chance of killing the ghost in the tree. Miss Cardell left a solemn message before sliding down the incline. This is my turf. That bastard's been staying here rent-free for years and it took my children away. I have a score to settle. Right. Then you stay here, Vivian. Roy slipped inside before Vivian could. Don't worry, Vivian. I'll take him back for you. Roy held the torch in one hand and slid down the dark tunnel with the help of the other, pushing him down. Around ten feet later, he landed safely, and then his boots became wet. There were puddles under the tree, though they only covered his ankles. It was freezing, however, and Roy gasped as he shivered. No wonder Letho asked me to wear thicker clothes. This place is seven or eight degrees colder. PRN, ten feet is around 3.05 meters. When he swung his torch around, Roy noticed Cardell crouching not far ahead from him. She looked alert, and when she saw him, Cardell beckoned him in silence. They were in a deep, musty underground space. The walls were filled with mud, algae, and vines, while the pond was littered with misshapen rocks. Aside from the clearing in the middle, there were narrow holes around the place. A normal human would have to crawl on their hands and knees to get through the holes. Croaks and hisses rang out from the holes, echoing in the chamber. Roy wondered if the space had existed under the hornbeam all this time, or if it was created by the child hunter. He stepped across the cold, putrid underground puddles and regrouped with Cardell. When he scanned the holes, a frightening idea popped up. Do all the holes contain a child hunter? No, Letho wouldn't spring this kind of joke on me. He would have mentioned it in the notebook. So the monster must be in one of the holes, killing its latest prey with its puke. Roy and Cardell looked at each other. Cardell pointed her chin at the nearest hole before pulling out a dagger that was smeared with salt from her belt. She held her torch with the other hand and dived into the hole. Roy followed her soon after. The hole was a tunnel no deeper than two feet, and it was only narrow enough to fit one person. The moment he started crawling, his pants got wet and the mud on the walls stuck to his shoulders, hindering his movement. They even quieted their breathing as they crept on, careful not to awaken anything unnecessary. From time to time, hisses and howls of the wind would assault them, annoying Roy. He was tense and nervous, worried that the slightest sound would invite trouble. What if it attacks from behind like this? How should we fight? He kept looking over his shoulder in case some monster showed up behind them. It didn't take long for them to finish the R crawl. At the end of the tunnel, they arrived at a dry, spherical nest, filled with branches, leaves, and bones of small animals. The inhabitant was nowhere to be seen, but it was obvious it fed there. The nest was littered with small skulls, spines, and femurs. The bones were smaller than a full-grown adult's, and they were a strange yellow hue. The bones obviously belonged to children. Cardell picked one up, and murder shone in her eyes as she gritted her teeth. She'd had her agenda when she'd formed the school, but she treated her students the best she could. They went through a couple more tunnels and marked them with the victim's bones at the entrances. Halfway through the fourth tunnel, they heard someone, or something, gurgle, as if vomiting. 
They held their breaths and shone their torches ahead, revealing a ghastly figure in the darkness. A humanoid creature with limbs as slender as branches was lying in the corner, its body covered in mud and algae. It was spitting yellow fluid at something. The moment the torches illuminated it, the creature turned around. Its face was gaunt with nostrils that caved in and a pair of dark holes was revealed. Its pale eyes were bloodshot, filled with rage and madness. The monster had no lips and its gums were laid bare. Translucent fluids dripped from its teeth as it had just vomited. Shocked by the light from the torch, it scurried into the shadow of its nest. The pair quickly chased after it with their torches in hand, but to no avail. Roy stayed alert while Cardell pried through the vomit, eventually revealing a head with golden hair. Child, can you hear me? Cardell wiped the filth off his head, revealing a gaunt, clean face, and the boy stirred. As Roy looked at the boy, the memories in his mind unveiled themselves, and the mist cleared. He realized who he had forgotten. Oh, I remember now, so you were the one who'd gone missing, Tom. It was the boy who'd said hi to him on his first day the orphan who had a toothy, sunny grin. He'd taken extra classes with Roy after school every day, and they eventually became friends. I had almost forgotten about you. He patted the boy's head and smiled, Roy's fear and trepidation replaced with a buoyant mood. Good thing we came in time. How do you feel, Tom? Tom opened his eyes groggily, his voice weak. Roy? Miss Cardell? What happened to me? L. What did you say? Look out! A ghastly figure pounced on Roy from the ceiling, and they rolled to the side, entangled with each other. They engaged in a scuffle, but the monster had the upper hand. The child hunter sat on Roy, slashing at him. Its long, slender claw gleamed menacingly under the light, targeting Roy's neck, but its advance stopped. Roy grabbed the claw with his left hand, his veins bulging. He took a bolt, smeared with salt out of thin air with his right hand, clenching and burying it deep within the monster's eye. The child hunter let out a cry that sounded eerily like an infant's as white smoke billowed from its injured eye and green blood trickled down its face. It escaped Roy's grip, leaping into the tunnel with tremendous strength, screaming as it did so. The child hunter squirmed in the tunnel like a catfish, disappearing from their sights in a moment. Get Tom out of here, Roy. I'll deal with it. Cardell gave chase, the trail of blood her clue, her torch and dagger in hand. That was close. I almost died. Roy heaved a sigh. The claw had been millimeters away from slitting his throat open. He would have died then. Are you hurt? Tom asked weakly. Don't worry, Tom. I'm fine. Roy wiped the sweat off his face and pulled the boy out of the sticky puke. Roy didn't understand the science behind it, but the puke looked and smelled like melted cheese. He rolled a bit of it into the size of his fist and stuffed it in his inventory space, before getting out of the tunnel with Tom on his back. He didn't run into any trouble along the way, and Cardell must have led the child hunter somewhere else. When he came back to the hole, Roy tugged at the vines as he went up and handed Tom to Vivian. She was pleasantly surprised, and Vivian covered the trembling boy in a coat. Roy, did you? Roy interrupted her before she could finish. No time to explain. The monster's not killed yet, I have to go back and help Cardell. Keep an eye on him. Roy went back before she could question him further. He followed the trail of the blood and found them at the depths of the fifth tunnel. Cardell and the child hunter were injured. Cardell was holding her bleeding stomach with one hand while swinging the torch with the other, keeping the child hunter at bay. She was deathly pale, obviously at her limits. The monster wasn't faring any better. It was blinded in one eye and had sustained dozens of minor injuries from Cardell's dagger, though they weren't bleeding. Apparently, the salt on the weapon wasn't enough to kill him. Roy thought about it for a moment and took out his hand crossbow. A bolt soared through the air, hitting the monster in its knee. It trembled and almost knelt, but not before it bared its fangs at Roy, letting out a guttural growl. It was poised to strike. Roy ignored it and shot its other knee. In the span of a few moments, Roy made the child hunter lame. Even if it could regenerate, it would take time, meaning it couldn't move fast for the time being. Quick, Miss Cardell, stay behind me. Roy kept shooting the monster in the legs as he retreated. Cardell was confused about the request, but she obliged. She stayed in her defensive stance as she slowly retreated with him. 
The pair slowly moved toward the tunnel, while the child hunter stayed in its nest, baring its fangs at the pair from twenty feet away. It swung its claws at them, threatening to rip them apart. It was like an infuriated, rabid dog, but because of the torches and weapons the pair had, it didn't advance. When the pair had gotten thirty feet away from the monster, Roy took out a green, glass container and hurled it through the air, and it smashed into the child hunter. Once the container was smashed into pieces, the whole tunnel rumbled, and the nest exploded into a great flower of flames, dancing along the sphere. It was as if the air itself had lit up, and the temperature rose by a few centigrades. The monster in the middle became a human-sized torch. Bright, hot flames licked it, and it screamed in pain. The beast tried to inch closer to the pair, but its legs were injured, failing it. Dancing Star was a powerful bomb. Even its sparks could quickly light up the branches around it. The flames spread quickly, lighting up the whole nest a short while later. The child hunter wandered its nest for two minutes before collapsing to the ground, its strength disappearing. In the end, it became nothing more than a handful of ash. Child hunter killed, 100 EXP gained. Roy heaved a sigh of relief after getting back to the tree hole. We have to take the poor children's remains with us, and fast. Chapter 42. Cleaning Up The moon shone on four incomplete skeletons lying in the yard. Most of them were slender and coated in a yellowish substance. Miss Cardell had a bandage wrapped around her waist, her face pale from the blood loss. She looked at the skeletons a few times with a confused expression. We killed the monster, so why can't I remember them? I can't remember their names, only Tom's. The notebook didn't mention it. Roy pursed his lips. But I think the memory erasure can't be reversed, not even after the monster's death. The traces can only be fixed if the would-be victim is still alive, like Tom. The pentagram on Roy's sleeve had fixed itself. Cardell shook her head, unhappy about the results. At least we saved Tom, Roy said, and the children will never be harmed by the monster again. Something bizarre had happened after they'd taken out the skeletons. An hour after that, the hole on the hornbeam had closed, and when Roy sprinkled salt on it, he couldn't summon the hole anymore. It was as if the hornbeam lost all its magic. Roy had a feeling the space the child hunter lived in didn't exist in the tree, but was instead another dimension. The power needed to maintain it slowly dissipated after its death, making it impossible to find. Roy wanted to go back and cut off the monster's tongue. Aukas said it's valuable. Well, no chance for that now. Did you find anything? Vivian came out from the house, looking fatigued and crestfallen. The brother she'd been searching for during the last two years was dead, and she couldn't even remember him. All the work she'd done looked to have been in vain. Can you identify them? I don't think so. The memory erasure is irreversible. When Roy noticed the despondent look Vivian was giving, he consoled her. Vivian, he's released from his pain. Perhaps he's now in Prophet Lebiota's kingdom. We avenged him, and we, uh, found his bones. At least he can rest in peace now. Be at peace. Vivian covered her face, took a deep breath, and wiped her tears away. I guessed he'd already passed when I saw the notes. I just couldn't accept it. You're right, Roy. He must be in Prophet Lebiota's kingdom now. I'll find a good spot for him to have his eternal rest. A short while of silence later, Roy said, Let's change the topic. How's Tom doing? Her eyes shone at the mention of the survivor. He had a hot shower, and I rubbed some salve on him. Then he went to sleep. He's lucky to have escaped with only a few scratches and a bite on the neck, and he didn't even remember the kidnap. All he remembered was he went to sleep, and when he woke up, he saw you guys and the child hunter. He'll be having nightmares for a few days, but otherwise, he's okay. That's great. Roy looked up at the sky. Let's talk about everything else tomorrow. I should be going back now. Cardell stopped him. Wait, Roy, where did you get the bomb used to kill the child hunter? Roy noticed the yearning in her eyes, and he understood that Miss Cardell was trying to get her hands on Dancing Star. That's an alchemy bomb made by a witcher. Only those acknowledged by witchers can use it, he said, lying. It's something my teacher gave to me so I could protect myself. I only had one, can't use it anymore. Is that so? Cardell looked disappointed. Roy found Toya beside the pond when he came back to the watermill. She was staring at her reflection in the water, 
looking forlorn and lonely. Roy thought she would have been eaten if she'd been in the house of Cardell. Roy sat beside her. Sorry for being late. Toya trembled, and she looked pleasantly surprised. It's fine. I can understand. Her voice was trembling with excitement. You have your job in the market. It must have been busy today, too. Even though she said that, Toya was actually terrified. She was worried the last few weeks had just been her imagination. When she noticed Roy wasn't home on time that day, her fear got the better of her, and she despaired, but luckily, it was just a scare. He came back. My friend's real. Her whole body relaxed as she felt relieved. Roy shook his head. It wasn't because of the job. There was a bizarre incident in the house of Cardell. It's related to the topic of magic I told you about last time, and also the neglected kids. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Roy ended his meditation at four the next morning and disposed of the Baldi's corpse before going to Aldersburg's marketplace. The herb booth he'd worked at for the last few weeks stood there, and he had a score to settle with the owner. But when he squeezed through the throng, he saw that the place was deserted. Neither Tross nor the booth could be found. It was nothing but a vacant spot. Frustrated, he went to Emile for answers, but he didn't expect them to be that shocking. Tross, I thought he told you about it. He left Aldersburg with his family and his money after yesterday's business. He left with his family? He's been here for more than ten years, and he's giving it all up just like that. Is he afraid of me? But I'm just a young man. Impossible. Emile looked surprised. What? He hasn't been running this business for ten years, Roy. Who told you that? He's just been here for two months or so, not even that much longer than you've been working, but his business was booming, so I wonder why he uprooted. Who is that guy, then? Is Tross a professional scammer? Roy pondered on the matter for a long time, but all he could remember was Tross's cunning smile, and a shiver crept up on him. Fine, he can leave if he wants to. Since he couldn't work at a non-existent booth, he spent more time in the morning working at the poultry booth. After killing the monster under the tree, his EXP bar was 820, 1000, 180 points shy of leveling up to level 3. If he could kill more chickens, maybe he could level up in a week. The house of Cardell was as peaceful as ever that afternoon. The children were still frolicking under the hornbeam, oblivious to the fact the lonely boy who'd been watching them at the classroom's doorstep had returned. Perhaps they never even realized that he was gone. The children who were neglected stayed neglected. Nothing had changed. Join them, Tom. Roy patted his head. You managed to escape from a scary monster and claw your way back from hell. There's nothing to be scared of. You'll have to fight for it if you want more attention and friends. Looking on like a fool won't cut it. Just fight anyone who'll try to bully you. Roy shoved the surprised boy to the group of children and watched as he blushed while clumsily greeting the others. Cardell came up to him quietly. She wasn't looking too well, and the wound from the night before would keep her down for a while. Nobody knew about the hornbeam's hole and the monster under it, for she had kept it a secret. The dead children couldn't be remembered, nor could their traces be recovered. There was no point in making the matter public, for it would invite nothing but suspicion and trouble. Vivian and I buried the remains in the nearby cemetery this morning. Cardell paused. And also, Roy, since you helped the school out and found the remains of Vivian's brother, as well as the children, you have my thanks. I know how witchers work, so you'll have your reward. How does a hundred crowns sound? A hundred crowns wasn't enough to cover the cost of Dancing Star, but that was all the school could afford. That won't be enough. As Roy looked at the frolicking children in the yard, something tugged at his heartstrings. I'll exchange it for a meal. Then take this, Roy. Vivian came up to him quietly and took off her silver necklace. It'll bring you luck and blessing from the gods, I just know it. She placed it around his neck and gave him a look of gratitude. Chapter 43. Mana Corruption One week later, Roy was sitting in the watermill's warehouse at night, his attention on his character sheet. Level 3, 0, 1500. Skill point 1, attribute point 1. If this were before, he would have allocated the attribute point to the stat he was the most proficient in, perception. That'd raise it to 7, but he changed his way of thinking lately. 
Roy realized that every improvement should have been done with the trial of the grasses in mind. No matter how high his perception was, it would have been for naught if he died in the trial. And before Letho left, he told Roy that the disciples' will and resistance to poison would affect their chances of survival. The higher those two aspects were, the better. If Roy wanted to strengthen his will and fortify his body, he had to consider will and constitution. Roy's will was 4.8, which was lower than average, while his constitution only became average because he took a lot of herbs. In other words, every attribute point he gained from that day on must be invested in those stats. He looked at his skills. Meditation Level 1 – The Training of the Body and the Soul Meditation calms you down, speeds up healing and recovery of your mana, as well as your body, improves coordination over time, and increases affinity with chaos energy. Tip. Leveling up this skill improves constitution and spirit permanently. Letho was old enough to be his grandfather, but even he hadn't managed to level meditation up to level 10. It won't be easy. But more importantly, leveling up can permanently increase my spirit and constitution. Roy concentrated on the plus sign after meditation, and then the level 1 slowly faded, changing into level 2 a moment later. Then Roy added his attribute point to will. One moment later, he felt a wave of warmth surging through his body, activating every inch of his skin, muscles, bones, and even blood vessels. It felt like they were absorbing something, becoming sturdier and stronger. His brain, the most mysterious part of him, was rejuvenated, enveloped by a cool feeling. He felt countless little hands caressing it, and every cell vibrated with excitement. He opened his eyes, and they looked like a galaxy, though it lasted only for a moment. Meditation Level 1, Level 2, Spirit, 6, 6.5, Constitution, 5, 5.5, Will, 4.8, 5.8. After experiencing the two-point increase in his stats, Roy thought he was already superhuman. The modification was still going on, and when he stood up to crack his joints, his whole body crackled. An electrifying sensation moved across him, upsetting Roy. Roy's face was scarlet, and his overexcitement filled him with courage and confidence. For a moment, he felt like he could run for a whole day and night without tiring, and he could face any challenge head-on. He took a deep breath, clenching his fists and loosening them, trying to calm himself down. Then he meditated on the haystack until he did. Normally, it would have taken years of training for someone to increase their stats by one point, but he increased by two points in a few minutes, so it was normal for him to feel uncomfortable. His change made him think about the trial of the grasses. The trial would modify and increase his physical capabilities to a far greater degree, perhaps to an incomprehensible level. The change would bring extreme discomfort and pain, which was the reason not many survived the trial. A soft moan could be heard from the haystack at the other end of the storehouse. You're awake, Toya. How do you feel? Roy sat beside her and slid his hand under the blanket to check the girl's temperature. Your temperature's normal, so the bryonia worked. He heaved a sigh of relief. What happened to me, Roy? Toya was still in her apron, though she looked listless. Her eyes gleam lost, her lips pale. It seemed like she'd just healed from a terrible sickness. You blacked out when you were sweeping the floor, and then you contracted a fever. Roy explained patiently. Hank and Mana sent you here after they found out what have happened. Don't worry, though. I gave you some herbs, and the fever's gone. I see. Toya pushed herself up and had some water with Roy's help. I'm sorry to trouble you again, she said in a thankful manner. It must have been tiring, taking care of me. Why don't you take a rest? Roy shook his head and stared into her eyes. We're friends, Toya, so tell me the truth. This isn't the first time it's happened, right? Toya squatted on the haystack, her hand gripping her knees, and she buried her chin in them. Fear and confusion showed on her face, and her voice trembled. I have no idea what's wrong with me. I seem to have a lot of illnesses. Aside from the hunchback, which everyone's been laughing at, I black out, have fevers, and mumble gibberish. Even my own father shies away from me in disgust. She then mumbled, Roy, am I just a burden? Of course not, Toya, Roy answered honestly. It has been great getting along with you. You're a good listener, and you're a smart, hard-working lady. But you're trapped in a little watermill, surrounded by shallow, narrow-minded people, 
So that's why you didn't manage to make many friends, and that's why you were led to this wrong way of thinking. Really? The girl's eyes shone for a bit after hearing that. Roy nodded. Of course. How do you feel right now? I want to know more about your sickness. Sure. She took a deep breath. Ask away. When did you start blacking out? Is it getting more frequent? Hmm. A frown creased her forehead as she thought about the question. If you're talking about the first time, it was probably not long after my body started becoming deformed, and I blacked out once a year since then. But recently, I would faint about four or five times a year. She paused for a moment to feel sorry for herself. I have the feeling I might just faint and never wake up again one day, but if this is what Melitella has in mind for me, then I shall accept it. Having painless, eternal rest is fine too. Toya, you're still young, and your life is filled with possibilities, Roy said, consoling her. Think harder. Are the occurrences happening around specific times during the year? Like Sauvine, Lamas, Burke, and the such? The last time this happened was on the day of Lamas, and it happened around Bellatine before that, Toya gasped. You're right, Roy. So my guess is on point. The closer we get to the magical dates, the more your magical energy resonates with the world, going out of control and harming your body. Roy sighed, and he cast her a look of pity. After he cast Observe on her, he noticed that Toya's constitution had fallen from 3 to 2.8. Her life force is weakening. What's a magical date? Toya was curious, but also fearful. And why do I have mana? Patience, Toya. I will tell you everything, Roy said. Do you remember Aratuza on Thanet Island, the one I told you about? I remember everything you told me, she said. That's a place where they train sorceresses, right? She took out the Gwent card Roy had given her, the one that had an illustration of a fiery-haired woman in a red dress, and her eyes gleamed. Sorceresses like Sabrina Glevisig can cast powerful magic. They're more fantastic than your tricks. Yes, Roy took a deep breath. But you know, most sorceresses weren't as gorgeous as the cards illustrated them to be when they were younger. Toya held her breath, her expression freezing. She had a strong feeling that Roy would say something that would scare her. Most of them started out looking like you. Roy organized his words and slowed down. They were different from everyone else because of the rampant mana in their bodies. But once they started training in those schools, they eventually returned to normal. Roy's teachings over the last few weeks had unveiled a part of the world's mysteries to the girl, and she would accept things easier then. S so you're saying... Toya's teeth chattered, and a crazy idea formed in her mind, suffocating her. I, I, yes. The eight magical dates are when mana runs rampant around, did the world. The mana in your body resonates with them, so you'd faint whenever the festivals drew nearer. He said solemnly. In other words, you have the talent to become a sorceress if you can get into Aratuza, and as far as I'm concerned, they take any girl from any corner of the world indiscriminately but you'll have to be bound under a hard contract. I can be just like her? Toya gripped the card tightly, her fingers turning pale. Will I return to normal, and nobody will laugh at me anymore? If you can become a sorceress and get modified by mana, of course you can go back to normal. Toya suddenly sobbed, and she leaned against the moldy wall, despondent. Tears streamed down her pale face, her expression complex. She looked sad, but also happy at the same time. You're lying, Roy. Toya couldn't believe it. You're my friend, so don't lie. I swear it's the truth, Roy promised. I'm not lying, just giving you another choice. No. Toya was wavering, but she shook her head. I'm just a country girl who's never left the mill, and I can't go anywhere. Hank and Mana wouldn't let me go. Besides, you said Aratusa is thousands of miles away from Aldersburg. I can't get there, not in forever. Roy was silent, for Toya was telling the truth. Most sorceresses' parents would refuse to send them to a school for sorceresses, for joining institutions like that meant cutting ties with their family. It brought no benefit to the parents, and most of them were greedy. They'd rather force their daughters to be free labor until the day of their death. I'll find a way, Toya. Stopping halfway through a plan wasn't Roy's style. He had a rough plan for a solution that had just popped into his mind a short while ago. I have to be honest, Toya. Every time you faint, your body's getting more corrupted by the mana, and it hurts you even more. 
I think you can feel that, can't you? Your body's weakening, and if you can't receive formal magical education in time... Roy licked his dry lips. I'm not sure you can live past twenty. Don't you want to see the outside world? In the era of ignorance, a deformed country girl would spend her short life in agony, but Roy thought Toya should have a chance. Since he had an idea, he would form a plan and go through with it. That was his creed. Besides, giving Toya a choice might mean another option for him in the future. Toya was trembling, perhaps from fear or excitement. Roy, you aren't just some normal human, are you? How do you know so many things, and why are you telling me? My identity has no bearing on the matter. What would you do if you were in the same position as me? Would you help me? Roy asked, and he found his answer in Toya's eyes. She wanted freedom. He held her calloused hand firmly. Friends should help each other. Just wait, Toya. You'll see the sunrise at Aratusa one day, I promise. Chapter 44 Returning the Corpse It was impossible for Roy to take Toya with him to Sintra and then Aratusa. It was unrealistic and Letho wouldn't agree to bring more dead weight with him on the way to the trial. I need help from someone else. The only powerful people he knew in Aldersburg were Seville Hoger, the wine dealer, and Cardell, the principal of the House of Cardell, as well as a member of the Revolution. If he wanted to send Toya to Aratusa, which was a thousand mile away, they were his only hope. The sun shone brightly that day. Seville was enjoying the sun on his recliner in his residence, it had almost been a month since the exorcism, and life had been well since then. His circles were almost gone, he'd gained more weight, and his hair and beard were looking slick. Been a while, Roy. You've been living well in Aldersburg. Seville beckoned a freckled, bearded maid who came with a bottle of honeyed wine. She filled the glasses and left quickly. You seem taller and stronger now, though you still don't have a beard. Ah, but you're a lot more manly now. Been having dwarven liquor every day? Roy was sitting on the cane chair beside Seville. He sipped the honeyed wine, and the sweet taste spread gently within his mouth. He replied, Of course, Mr. Seville. Dwarven liquor is on a whole other level compared to the fake, crude wine. How are you doing? Are the nightmares still haunting you after the hymn was destroyed? The nightmares are gone, thanks to you and Letho. He roared in laughter. Now I'm once again the strong and lively squirrel of Mahakam. He clumsily turned around and held his chin with one hand while looking at Roy. But I think about my poor friend Ken at night sometimes. He's still in the barrel, and then there goes my appetite. He paused, then Seville hinted something at him. I wonder when Ken's body will be returned to its rightful place. He needs to rest in peace. Oh, right, Roy. I didn't see Letho today. He's out for business. Still hasn't come back, Roy asked. Why don't I help you settle the matter, Mr. Seville? Roy, if I'm guessing this right, Seville rubbed his beard, his gaze doubtful. You're saying you'd hand Ken's body back to the revolutionists alone, and nobody would see you? Yes, Mr. Seville. Roy's eyes gleamed, but he didn't panic, looking reassured. Will you let me handle this? Half an hour later, a pale man's body lay on the ground, his eyes closed, his limbs twisted in unnatural angles. At the same time, the strong scent of alcohol and the faint stench of the body assailed Roy. His eyes widened, and he stared unblinkingly at the famous man, the leader of the revolutionists, Vernon Ryan. He was also Ken, Seville's brother, the thinker who never drank a drop of wine, but died because of it. The body was wearing a gray shirt that was standard to peasants and people who did manual labor, as well as a pair of tight black pants. His limbs were slender, and so was his body. His ears were pointed at the tips, his nose was hooked, and his lower jawline was sharp. The cheekbones that jutted out spoke of his elven bloodline. There was a hint of terror on his face, perhaps from the fear he felt before his death. His arms were limp by his sides. It was as if he'd tried to grab onto something, but had failed. The body was wrinkled from being soaked for so long, and disgusting patches were seen on his torso. It was just like a specimen that had been soaked in formalin, like they did in his past life. No, this one's creepier, and I'm here to witness it. Seville looked pained, but also melancholic, and he covered his nose. I've taken him out as you asked, Roy. What will you do next? Smuggling him out at night is impossible. I heard the revolutionists are going for a second march before Salvin, and the Baron's men are watching us. 
Want to see a trick, Mr. Seville? Roy went up to the body and observed the limbs. He tugged at the body's pants and noticed a peculiar tattoo on the right heel. It was in the shape of a handful of thick, curled fur. Wait, that's a squirrel's tail, he frowned, then had a guess, but he didn't tell the dwarf. Instead, he touched the body, and Vernon Ryan was nowhere to be found. What? Seville's jaw dropped. How did you do it, Roy? Are you a sorcerer on top of a witcher's disciple? Do you know how to cast teleportation spells? This is a secret. I'll need you to keep this a secret for me, Mr. Seville, Roy requested. Very well, then. Dwarves are very respectful of our friend's secrets, Seville assured. And please take this as my token of apology. I shouldn't have doubted you. The Baron's lackeys couldn't imagine you to possess this skill. So will the reward be the same as how we've negotiated? Why don't we leave it until after I've finished the request? No problem, Seville answered. You'll be my buddy if you finish this, and I always treat my buddies well. It had been harrowing for Cardell over the last few days. Her stomach was heavily injured in the fight against the child hunter, and it was still throbbing. Then the revolutionists brought bad news. The second march wasn't going too well. The Baron's bloody counter scared off the opportunists who were weak in their conviction. Even though it was nearly the day of the march, they only managed to rally fifty people. With that amount of people, they would only be seen as a joke. Cardell sighed. It'd be great if everyone was like Roy. He's smart, brave, knows how to fight, and isn't afraid of monsters. It's a pity he's a witcher's disciple. He's not going to stay long. Cardell went back to her office feeling crestfallen, but the moment she went in the strong smell of alcohol wafted across her. She frowned, but still, she followed the trace to her desk. And then her eyes widened in horror. There was a body under her table. The face was bloated and pale, but she would recognize it even if it turned to ash, and she felt her soul leave her. The great leader and my mentor Vernon is dead? Roy was in the yard, caressing the hornbeam. He saw Cardell going into her office, then she came out with a letter, looking furious, and he sighed. I didn't want to scare you, but you're the only revolutionist I know. I'm sorry. Take it as the meal you owe me. So the house of Cardell's principal is the revolutionist's top brass. Seville nodded in approval after listening to the report. My sources had known that something was wrong with the school, and I had my own suspicions, but there was no evidence. Good work, Roy. The Baron's lackeys didn't notice you, and my friend Ken is finally back to the place he wanted. Seville extended his hand and said, A promise is a promise. I told you you were my buddy if you settled this matter for me. No need to be formal, Roy. What do you need? Money, wine, or weapons? Seville knew Roy must have had something to ask from him the moment he took the request. Or do you need my help? I'll do it if I can. Roy hadn't expected the request they'd set aside when they'd come to Aldersburg to help him to this extent. He hadn't gone through much for it since it'd just been a delivery request. Mr. Seville. Call me Seville, Roy. It'd be rude if you kept the honorific. Oh, um, Seville, Roy said, correcting himself, though he couldn't imagine being buddies with a septuagenarian. Formalities, I guess. Do you know any sorcerers? Someone who lives near Aldersburg, and it'd be best if they were a sorceress from Aratusa. Seville pinched his beard and gave it some thought. Sorry, Roy. As far as I'm concerned, no sorcerer lives near Aldersburg. There's a black-haired one in Vengerberg, but that's too far away. Why are you looking for one, though? He asked. If you trust me, why don't you spill the beans? Maybe there's another way to settle this. I don't mean to brag, but I call some shots in this city. Roy thought about it and told him about Toya. Nothing to lose here. Seville had a weird look on his face once he was done listening, and he looked at Roy as if he were an exotic animal. Roy, if I'm correct, you're a witcher's disciple, and you're Jeg, owing to be a witcher. Why are you helping an ugly country girl by sending her to Aratusa? She might not even remember you after her training. Just because you pity her? He told Seville what he thought. Don't you think witchers and sorcerers are alike, Seville? They have a tragic childhood and are forced to make choices they don't want. I think she should have a chance to choose, and I hope someone will give me a chance if I somehow get into a compromising position someday. Seville felt something stir within him after hearing the story. He thought that Roy was interesting, 
though he wasn't as handsome as a dwarf, and he laughed. You're an interesting guy, Roy. Most witchers I know wouldn't interfere, but you did. I'll help you because of the things you said alone. I'll send a carriage and some dwarves to escort the girl to Thaned Island. She should have a chance to choose, just like what you said. But whether she can get into Aratusa, well, that depends on her own effort and luck. But it'll have to wait for a few days. Seville stood on his tiptoes and grabbed Roy's shoulder. It's nearly Salvin, and I think the coachman has a right to celebrate it. I hope the revolutionists can stop, though. I wonder if they'll pull something crazy, since they did receive their leader's body out of nowhere. I left a letter for Miss Cardell, too, Roy answered. It's a threat letter, written a la Sparrow Triad. She might not be fooled, but at least it'll distract the revolutionists from blindly protesting against the Baron. That way, they might not be used for any scheme. Chapter 45 Departure and Return It was the 6th of November in the year 1260. Roy was wearing a yellow wool coat, sitting on the edge of Walls Inn's rooftop, legs dangling, and he held a portrait. The portrait depicted Roy and Toya, both smiling. During Salvin, he took Toya to Seville's residence behind her parents' back and enjoyed a sumptuous Salvin feast. He could still remember it vividly. He and Toya had had their fill of honeyed wine, messed up the songs they sang, and posed for a second-rate artist. Then they surrounded the bonfire in the yard, held hands with the bearded dwarves, and danced Mahakam's specialty dance the whole night. When the next morning came, Toya woke up from her first hangover and was sent to the carriage heading for Aratusa. How should I contact you once I get there, Roy? Toya stuck her head out of the carriage window before she left. She held his arm, tears welling up in her eyes, and they were filled with excitement, unease, and longing. Witchers don't have a stable home. Roy patted her head and joked, I'll visit you in Aratusa after a few years. Hope you can show me some real magic then. It's a promise then. Toya's voice had a hint of mischief. If you haven't come after I've returned to normal, I'm hunting you down no matter where you go. Roy kept the portrait in his inventory space and held the necklace hanging around his neck. He had completed his education in the house of Cardell not long ago and said his goodbyes to Vivian, Tom, and Cardell. I wonder what Cardell did. The revolutionists have been really quiet these days. Maybe they're shocked by their leader's death. It was a peaceful Sauvine in Aldersburg. There were no marches or gang fights. Roy stopped renting his room. He didn't leave anything for Hank and Mana, even after taking their daughter away. It was their punishment for abusing her. They can try hunting me down if they want. If they can find where I am, that is. He didn't plan to continue working in the marketplace, and his education was done for the time being. The words he could read were enough to understand the witcher's notes. He was going to start reading through the recipe formulas. When he hopped off the rooftop, entering the lobby, a familiar feeling welled up within him. Sauvin was over. But the party in the inn wasn't. A bard was leaning against the wall, wearing tight-fitting clothes and leather shoes. He was playing his lute to a beautiful tune. A group of burly men were holding their foaming beers and moved to the music on the dance floor. Many women in bustiers and heavy makeup were going through the merry inn, revealing their skin, lifting their fluffy dresses, and flirting back with the men as they beckoned them. The inn was merry, but someone stuck out like a sore thumb in the corner. The table for four was filled with glasses of colorful wine, but he was the only one drinking. Letho's bald head and stern look made him look dark, and the sword hanging on his muscular back warned everyone to stay away. A woman chuckled and approached him. Alone? I can be your partner. Letho looked at her, and her familiar smile warmed him up a bit. Sorry, but I'm not in the mood today. Next time. How cruel. It's only been a month, but you're already acting this cold. I can still remember how strong you were. Oh, your arm is tense. Just relax and let me handle everything. The woman beamed and leaned against his shoulder, then she craned her neck. She noticed the dried blood on his armor that still had a stench, but she wasn't surprised, as witchers were like that. When she looked down, she saw a big package that was bursting at the seams laying on the ground at the witcher's right. She could see something red bleeding through the blue package, and she asked, What is that? 
She tried to take the package, but halfway through, Letho's muscular hand grabbed her arm. Keep your curiosity in check, woman. Stay out of things in which you shouldn't butt in, Letho said calmly. But the dangerous gleam in his eyes shocked the woman. She trembled, led and got up carefully. The woman pursed her lips and glared at him. I see. So all you want from me is my body, huh? Well, don't ask for me next time, then. Humph. She then went to the dance floor and flirted with the other men. Letho wasn't frustrated. Women were just things to spice up his life, nothing more. And then he felt something, so he looked across the dance floor and met Roy's gaze. Has it been a year since we met? You grow fast. The witcher looked at the boy who came up to him and steepled his hand under his chin. His sharp senses were telling him that the boy had undergone a great change. He'd started out as a scrawny one, but he'd changed to become more lean, lively. His eyes were shining, his complexion healthy, and he looked better than he was. Most people would have to work endlessly for six months to a year for them to change so much, but it hadn't been two months since Roy had left care. Two years, actually. So that makes it one month and two years? Roy sat beside Letho and sipped some fruit wine. So, I've been living on my own here for a long time. Have I passed your test? The witcher nodded. You did well on your own. Roy looked at the package the woman was curious about, and he sniffed the air. You left me here for a month just for this? Letho felt like testing him. Guess what's inside? Even though you've cleaned it and removed most of the smell, that stench can't fool me. It's, hmm, a monster's innards, isn't it? Letho tossed the package to him, and Roy scrambled to open it. He almost threw it away. The first thing he saw was an eyeball the size of a fist, and it had been wiped clean. When he touched the back of the eyeball, he could feel the nerves and blood vessels that were still red. Roy looked around and stuffed the eyeball back when nobody was watching, and then he took out a yellow paw from the bag. The underside had pads like those of feline creatures. Three sharp fangs protruded in the front, looking like black scythes. It was hard and was about the length of an extended hand of a human. Roy imagined how easily the claw could rip through a human's armor and disembowel the wearer. Aside from the eyeball and claw, there was also an elliptical heart in there, a long beak with the fur removed and a bloody head. A griffin. The package was filled with the most valuable parts of a griffin. He murmured, You spent a month killing a griffin to prepare the decoction for me? He was touched that Letho went to kill a griffin alone. Griffins were proud creatures. They were hard to hunt, had a superb sense of smell, a powerful body, claws and beak that were as hard as steel, and had no obvious weakness. It would be a deadly creature for any witcher. Roy also regretted the fact he didn't take part in it. It would have been a great experience to watch the fight at close quarters. Are you hurt? Letho shook his head. Some problems arose, but it ended well. Come. I'll teach you the way to dismember it, and I'll check on your progress. Chapter 46 Potion Letho reserved a room and put down his luggage before handling the griffin's parts. Then he asked Roy about the events in Aldersburg, and the boy told him about the child hunter under the hornbeam in the house of Cardell. That was some good luck. Child hunters on par with a drowner in terms of battle power and danger. It's perfect for training newbies like you, Letho said. As long as you dodge its fangs and claws, using fire and salt should kill it easily. Using Dancing Star was a bit of a waste, but since you lived and it died, it was worth it. Good job with the House of Cardell's case, boy, Letho said, praising sincerely. He wasn't talking about Roy's performance in battle, but his performance during the investigation. A witcher who knew how to think would outlive those who only resorted to violence. And then Roy showed the yellow vomit he took by chance to Letho. Letho analyzed it thoroughly and nodded. Child hunters are rare, and of all the witchers I know, only Aukus and Serret managed to kill one fifty years ago, but regrettably, they didn't manage to retrieve enough fresh vomit. He frowned. I'm not sure about its composition, but I felt my mana flow being blocked when I held it. I couldn't even cast any signs. It's not enough for the separation effect to take place, but at least it has the effect of dimerishium. It can counter spellcasters and monsters that rely on magic to a degree. Maybe some sorcerers would buy it at a high price. Keep it well, since it's your spoil. He handed it back to Roy. 
Keep it in a bottle for best effects. It degrades if not fresh. Roy's eyes gleamed, but at the same time, he regretted not taking all the vomit with him. He didn't need to keep it in his bottle, though, for he had a better way of preserving it, his inventory space. They chatted for a while, then Latho took him to a vacant plot outside the city to check on his crossbow training and herb knowledge. Roy had unlocked crossbow mastery level one and trained every night. He was perfect in terms of shooting position, aiming accuracy, and reaction speed, though it was relative to his short training period. Naturally, the Witcher was satisfied. Even after getting the herb knowledge imprinted in his mind by the Witcher, and knowing more than 50 herbs along the way, Roy had seen more herbs when he was working for the scammer Tross. He came into contact with common ones like buckthorn, marigold, belladonna, and mandrake every day, and he even saw rare herbs like beggartic's flowers, blood moss, and paris. Right now, Roy could discern more than 80 herbs in terms of habitat, effect, and appearance. Letho had nothing to add to that anymore. Since Roy's theoretical knowledge was enough, it was time for his practical lessons. You spent most of the month learning common speech, yes? Letho rubbed his bald head. Yeah, I forgot about that, my bad. Since you haven't looked into the potions in the notebook, I can teach you. Since I've depleted my potions and bombs, it's time to replenish the stock. Oh, and there's the decoction for the trial. It's a troublesome one, so I'll need your help. Potion making was a branch of alchemy. The potions, decoctions, oils, and bombs made through alchemy needed mana to keep them under control. Some of them could only be used by witchers, while potions could be created and used by most people. In the game, alchemy was just a simple matter of collecting materials and pressing a button, and then the item would show up in the player's inventory space. But there was no such thing in this world. Alchemy was an extremely complex skill to master, and the same applied to potion making. For potions, the maker had to possess the skills, tools, and correct materials. The materials were categorized as either base, main, support, or neutralizer. The tools and apparatus to make potions were even more complex, and together they were called the alchemy workstation. Letho spent the day buying herbs and bottles, and then he rented a room and modified it into an alchemy lab. Roy was stupefied when he went into the room. This is just a kitchen. The first thing he saw was the stove powered by a blower in the middle, and a cauldron sat on it. A mortar, bowl, plate, and gooseneck distiller propped on a mini stove were placed before the cauldron. A clock was hanging on the right, used to see how long the herbs had been brewed for, and beside the clock sat dried herbs that were needed for potion making. The second layer of the rack on the right had a pestle on it, used to crush the herbs in the mortar. On the left, beyond the blower, pots filled with dwarven liquor, water, oil, and other fluids were placed on the topmost rack. They were used as the base for different potions. The second layer held the containers for the potions, and they came in various sizes. It's, um, different from what I had expected, Roy said. What do you mean different? Have you seen a different workstation before? Letho asked. I just think it's a bit too crude. Does the school use this kind of workstation too? Roy couldn't believe that the tools would be so basic. It felt more like a workshop that made illegal substances rather than potions. In his imagination, alchemy was related to chemistry, and he thought they must have at least had test tubes, alcohol burners, and retort stands. You're unhappy with this? Letho was surprised, and he wondered why Roy was so upset, but he explained patiently. The tools in the school are of course better and prettier, but you have to understand that we have limited resources here. Having a basic workstation is already hard enough. Of course, it'd be a different story if a sorcerer would lend us his lab. Those guys are perfectionists and want nothing but the best for everything, so they'd have the best equipment lying around. Letho continued. But this here is enough for a beginner like you. Then he knocked Roy's head and lectured. Now concentrate. I'll show you the way to make a marigold potion, the simplest one there is. Only once, though. Roy massaged his forehead and concentrated on the process. Letho first took a bag of marigold and nettle, and then he put them on the workstation on the right to balance them on the scale. Next, he placed and crushed them in the mortar with the pestle before handing a sample to Roy. The crushing process was a delicate one. 
insufficient strength would make the potion less potent, but too much strength would cause a higher chance of overbrewing, thus causing them to fail to create the potion. The only way to gauge the strength needed under such conditions was none other than through experience. Once Roy had seen enough, Letho filled a quarter of the cauldron with water, an ounce of crushed nettle, and two ounces of crushed marigold. Then he stirred the mixture with a ladle, and the liquid turned light yellow. Letho used the blower to light up the flames under the cauldron. At the same time, he looked at the clock, waiting quietly. Roy took the chance to ask about the amount of the main materials used in the making of the marigold potion, as well as the base. Letho explained patiently, and he observed Roy's mastery of alchemy's theoretical knowledge and herbs through questioning. The potion hadn't started boiling after fifteen minutes, and a faint, fresh scent wafted from the cauldron. Letho doused the fire and held the cauldron by its handle, and then poured the potion into a translucent bottle. Despite his muscular figure, Letho surprisingly handled the potion with great care, not even spilling a drop. It might have sounded weird, but it was like seeing Letho knit a sweater with perfect mastery of the needle. Letho corked the bottle at the end. Roy boiled down the whole process into a few parts. Add water and the materials to the cauldron, pull on the blower, cook it until it forms a slurry, then kill the heat. A funny idea popped into his mind. If he were standing behind Letho, he would have thought him a chef cooking something up. You can rub this potion on your wounds or ingest it. Helps with regeneration and prevention of infi, scission. Better than plain eating the plant. Letho shook the bottle, looking satisfied. You have to master this. It's the basic among the basics and one of the most useful potions around. You aren't strong enough to take swallow and such. This is more like a medicinal brew than a potion, Roy thought, and he looked at Letho expectantly. How potent is it? You'll know once you take it after sustaining an injury, Letho said. Probably halves the recovery time if your wounds aren't that serious. Can I try? Letho stepped aside, giving the stage to Roy. Roy rolled his sleeve up and took a bag of marigold and nettle. Then he reproduced the process by memory. First he weighed and ground them into powder. He thought it'd be easy since he'd memorized the process, but a problem arose the moment he started. Weighing alone took a lot out of him, and he was considerably slower than the Witcher. When he finally finished weighing and went on to the crushing, he ran into another problem. How fine should I make it? Hmm, a bit larger than what mills make? As he crushed the materials, he glanced at Letho, trying to get a hint, but Letho was prepared. He raised his chin at Roy, telling him to continue. Roy sighed, no point in thinking too much. He let go and went with his instincts. He poured the water from the pot for ten seconds and stopped when it filled about a quarter of the cauldron. He kept the heat low and the blower only blew on the flames three times. Fifteen minutes later, the potion was done, but it was much darker in color and it radiated a sharp, pungent smell. Roy looked tense. Letho's potion was light yellow and smelled nice. What the heck is this? He wasn't let down, though. It was normal to fail the first time. He went on with the bottling, but his middle finger was placed incorrectly and was scalded by the cauldron. The potion splashed everywhere, but he ignored it and poured the remaining liquid into the bottle. He shook it once and corked it before placing it on the workstation. You call this a marigold potion? The thing that can stop bleeding and prevent inflammation? Letho took and observed the potion, his face inscrutable. When he opened it to take a whiff, his face twitched. The only thing this thing can do is ease bowel movements. Fail. Again. Chapter 47. Drink the pain. Under the dim light, a black-haired youth stood before a workshop, his hands deftly moving between the bags of herbs, scale, pestle, cauldron, and blower. He added two ounces of dried marigold and an ounce of nettle into the mortar and crushed them with half his strength, stirring them at the same time. He did it twice in one second, and he had to do it a thousand times. Then the cauldron was a quarter filled with water before the crushed materials were added, and then the brewing started. It wasn't difficult, but his movements were precise, calculated, and clean, as if he had an invisible ruler gauging everything he did. Fifteen minutes later, he killed the heat and held the cauldron by the handle. He swirled it around and poured the hot fluid into a bottle. No longer was he impatient, 
but instead swift and patient. When he took the potion and recognized the scent of chrysanthemum, he carefully handed it to Letho, who was nearby and looking at him with his arms crossed. Here, Letho, what do you think? Letho took a whiff and dipped his finger into the potion, then he put it in his mouth and closed his eyes to better feel it. Roy wiped the sweat off his forehead, clenching his fists, looking nervous, just like a criminal waiting for his verdict. Congratulations, boy. Roy heaved a sigh of relief. He opened his arms and spun, almost crying tears of happiness. God knew how the last three days had been. Aside from his regular training, he'd had to start brewing potions the moment he woke up and had to go into meditation when he was resting. Alchemy's emphasis on details was no joke, and it was much harder and much more boring than crossbow training. Roy wasn't interested in precision in both lives, but Letho paid a lot of importance to alchemy, and he was strict on Roy. Damn, I wish I could have a skill that lets me make potions instantly. It's worse than most village herbalists, but its effect is the real deal, Letho said. All that's left is to practice. Make thousands of them, and you'll eventually improve. Oh, right, Letho. Since marigold potions are better at treating wounds than normal herbs, why don't we sell it? Roy asked. Will it sell? Letho shook his head. Strayhead, if you thought of that, everyone would have too. The civilians would think it was too pricey, so they'd rather buy the herbs. It's cheaper and sufficient for their daily use. The rich ones don't need it. They have famous doctors treating them in private. Healthcare involves a lot of things no matter the city. Lots of connections and power play in it. Sell it on the streets, sure. You might get lucky and sell some, but then someone will rat on you and off to the dungeon you go. You ain't having anything else but mice for a month. Forget that idea. Potions are best used for yourself. Roy thought that was a shame. I can make money if I try to use some of my connections, but that's going to waste too much time. I could have been a businessman instead. This potion can be preserved for a month or so if done right. Continue, Letho urged. Make about five potions, and that'll be enough for the trip. Three days passed in the blink of an eye. Under Letho's watchful gaze, Roy made a few dozen attempts and managed to make around five usable potions, albeit all of different quality. He was seeing a slow improvement in his alchemy skills. Roy had made one usable potion for every ten attempts at first, but then he could make one for every nine attempts. Letho could make eight usable ones for every nine attempts. That was understandable, though, since it had just been days since he started making potions, so it was incomparable to the decade of experience the Witcher had, and he hadn't actually started on the path of alchemy, since the skill hadn't even shown up in the character sheet. This is going to be a long journey. And with that, Roy's alchemy practical lessons ended for the time being. Letho took over the workstation to create decoctions, bombs, and the potion for the trial for Roy. Roy didn't just stand by either. He helped with the first few steps. Five ounces of dried celandine and an ounce of drowner brain ground into powder. Remember what I've told you. Letho sent order after order, his face inscrutable, and his hands moved quickly between the tools. His large figure was a stark contrast to his dexterous limbs working on the tools. The Witcher looked more like an oil painter creating his opus, while Roy was like a wind-up puppet who was working all day in a dark alchemy lab. Most people would have been dizzy at that point, but thanks to his high will stat, Roy could stay concentrated for a long time without feeling any fatigue. After taking part in the brewing, he understood the difference between potion and decoction. Take Swallow, the most common potion witchers used, as an example. The only materials were celandine and drowner brain, but the steps involved were drying the ingredients, crushing them, heating, distilling, heating again, and more. There were a total of a few dozen steps, and every one of them had to be done precisely. One wrong move or shaking fingers would end up creating a flawed potion. The most important part came after filling the bottle with the potion. The witcher would hold it with both hands and go into meditation. When that happened, Roy could feel Letho communicating with the decoction, though it was purely magical. Letho was trying to calm the decoction and stabilize it. If that wasn't done, the decoction would just be a half-finished product. Roy was engrossed with alchemy, and he didn't notice the time pass. 
He could still help with the early preparations for Swallow, but the oils, bombs, and more advanced potions confused him, turning his brain to mush. There were too many steps, and all of them were too complex for him. It wasn't something someone of his level could understand, so he stopped thinking and only followed the Witcher's orders. Even though all he learned was the making of the Marigold Potion, he got more proficient with the tools as he helped the Witcher. It would act as the foundation of his future studies. A long time later, perhaps a week, Letho made two swallows, two dimerician bombs, and a lot of potions. And then he suddenly said, Roy could leave the lab to have an off day. Roy heaved a sigh after being relieved from the intense, pressing work environment, but the next day, Letho took out a particular bottle from a row of potions. This is the potion I made for you. Letho looked into Roy's eyes and said slowly, Regular intake will slowly increase your resistance to potions' toxicity. It builds your foundation before taking the decoction of the grasses. All the color drained from Roy's face at the mention of toxicity. No wonder I got a day off. Even death row inmates have their last supper. Roy might have looked like he didn't care about the dangers of the trial, but still, his instinctive defensive measures told him to stay away from poisonous substances like that. Don't worry, boy. As it stands, your body can take the toxicity. Letho noticed his reluctance, and for once he encouraged Roy. It won't harm you, though you might squirm in pain for a short while, speaking from experience. Will I pass the trial of the grasses if I drink this? Roy put the glass bottle under the light and noticed that the decoction wasn't as pure as the other potions. Instead, it was filled with green strings that looked like parasites, and the color was a heavy black. It was also sticky and gooey, and Roy felt disturbed. There are no absolutes in this world, Letho told him honestly. All I can tell you is that if you can get through this arduous process, it'll increase your chances of surviving the trial of the grasses. Roy took a deep breath and forced himself to calm down. How painful will this be? Do you know about childbirth? Why do you ask that? According to Rodriguez's experiment report, anyone who takes this potion will experience the same pain as childbirth. Roy kept quiet and ignored childbirth. He wondered if he could take it. My will is 5.8, and my constitution is 5.5. It's a bit higher than an average adult's, so I should be fine. It's been 20 years since the Viper School has had new blood. If you fail the trial... Letho trailed off and he patted Roy's shoulder, as if by magic, Roy calmed down. So be brave and take the potion. If we were following the original plan, this should have only been taken six months down the line. Letho had doubt in his eyes. Maybe you matured faster, so you reached my expectations ahead of time. Roy knew why. He had added tribute points, which was something other people didn't. Don't feel too stressed out. You'll have two days to prepare. Can I not take the potion? Hmm? Joking. Roy forced a smile, and some color returned to his face. He couldn't back out at that point, and it was in his plan anyway. Since he'd chosen to become a witcher, he would see his choice through, no matter how painful it might be. And since that potion could increase his chances of surviving the trial, he had no reason not to drink it. I don't need it. Let's do it today. As Letho watched, Roy took the potion and swirled it, but he didn't take it immediately. He hunkered down and meditated, clearing his mind and relaxing his body. He'd fully recovered half an hour later, and he glanced at the clock before uncorking the bottle and gulping the potion. His mouth was filled with a bitter, salty, raw taste. It was as if he had raw oyster, pork, and soil at the same time. Even though the potion traveled down his stomach in an instant, the weird taste still lingered in his mouth. His face scrunched up and he clenched his fists before his chest and body shook uncontrollably. The potion had started to take effect. The potion stayed in his oral cavity for a moment and rushed up into his head. Roy felt like he just smashed his head against a wall and his consciousness started to fade. His eyes rolled back and he was forced out of his meditation before falling to the ground. When the potion hit his stomach, it triggered a weird chemical reaction, releasing an enormous amount of heat. His torso felt like it was being grilled in an oven, threatening to cook him, to turn him into ash. He reflexively scratched at the ground and rolled around, trying to chase the heat away. His eyes were closed, his face red and tense, 
as if he were experiencing a nightmare. A moment later, the pain reached its pinnacle, and he opened his eyes. They were bloodshot. Roy let out a guttural roar, and veins bulged at an abnormal speed on his neck and temples. Litho hunkered down beside him, his face inscrutable, though reminiscence filled his eyes. Hold on, boy. The longer you can go, and the more pain you can take, the better your reward will be. Chapter 48 Plans and Departure You're awake. How do you feel, boy? Letho asked gruffly as Roy opened his puffy eyes with difficulty. His whole body was sore, and when he looked around, he noticed he was lying on the bed of an in-room. It was nearly noon, and the light outside was blindingly bright. He could see doubles of the furniture around him, blurring his sight. Roy shut his eyes and shook his head. It took a long time before he stopped seeing double. How long was I out for, Letho? He frowned and covered his eyes to block the light reflecting from Letho's bald head. Can you sit somewhere else? The light's hurting my eyes. Letho shrugged and moved to the chair before handing him a bowl of water. You were out for a whole day. Frankly, that's a lot shorter than I had expected. You have a good body, Letho said calmly, as if it were just a diagnosis from a doctor. Well, I don't feel so good. I swear I was dead. Roy gulped all the water in one go, and a cool sensation flowed through him. Then he was reminded of the feeling from before, of after he'd taken the potion. It was as if a fire had been lit in his chest, burning all his cells and vessels. He could feel his body scream, and it felt as if thousands of knives were piercing him. In other words, it felt like getting pierced by red-hot knives. You should have warned me more, Roy grumbled, and a hint of fear welled up within him. He never wanted to feel that kind of sensation again. It was worse than death. It did deviate from what I had in mind. Letho looked at him apologetically. I thought you'd black out quickly under that intense pain. Actually, most of the disciples who took the potion since the last hundred years or so didn't last five minutes. Most couldn't even last for three. They'd lose all consciousness at that point, so their pain only lasted for a short while, but you. What about me? You lasted six minutes. Letho took out a gray notebook and flipped through it. You didn't make a mess of yourself, nor did you spew blood, mumble, or spasm, he said solemnly. Roy felt a chill running down his spine, and he felt glad he strengthened his stats before that. Why didn't you tell me about that before? Well, you're still alive, aren't you? You managed to get through it. Letho patted his shoulder and calmed him down. Don't worry, boy. That pain only shows up the first time you take the potion. You'll only feel half of that next time, and it'll eventually lessen to the point you'll only frown at it. I thought that was the only one I had to take. Roy gulped, fear showing on his face. Half of it would still be painful. How many more do I have to take? It runs for three months, and on a weekly basis, so you have eleven more to go. Shit. Roy took a deep breath and massaged his face, which was drenched in sweat. But I can't stop. If I do, all I did would be for naught. Your willpower and body are better than most disciples. Letho was observing him in silence, and he heaved a sigh of relief when Roy didn't retort. Then he shifted the topic. And maybe it's because your body's more developed because of your age. The other disciples took the potion before they were even ten, while you're nearly fourteen. Wait. So age is an advantage. If that's the case, why do witchers go for younger children? Roy held back his doubt. Children are pure, innocent, and full of possibilities. Their guide can depict any kind of future for them. Letho was patient. Children haven't fully developed their bodies yet, and they can get their bodies systematically modified by the decoction of the grasses. On the other hand, adults have gone through the changes of puberty and have settled down, so any modification would be harder compared to children. Most can't see through the mutation. Their bodies would break down and die. Modifications? Break down? Roy finally understood the meaning behind the trial of the grasses. High death rate was just a facet of it. The body breaks down if they can't take it, but what if they can see it through, and then do it again? Is the modification a one-time event? Roy blurted out the question he'd always had. Can anyone take the decoction of the grasses from schools like the Wolf School or the Griffin School once they manage to mutate once? According to what he knew, every school had a different recipe for the decoction of the grasses 
which strengthened different aspects after the mutation. Cat school witchers wore light armor and had agile, phantom-like movements, so their decoction would increase their dexterity, while wolf school was more balanced, so their decoction would increase every aspect by a bit. Griffin school witchers' strength lay in their signs, so their will would be strengthened. Bear school witchers wore heavy armor and used two-handed swords, and they would consume more potions in a short time. In that case, their decoction should strengthen their constitution. If someone manages to see through multiple trial of the grasses from different schools, what kind of witcher would he become? Theoretically speaking, the body's resistance toward poison would greatly increase after a trial. So would it make a second trial easier? Or maybe the decoctions would repel each other, killing the user. That was Roy's hypothesis. Are you talking about multiple modifications? Letho's eyes gleamed dangerously, and he warned, That idea is preposterous, boy. In all my life, I've never heard of anyone who'd taken different decoction of the grasses, not even if they took it at a different time. No such fool exists. Even if they do, they would already be dead. Right, you haven't even gotten through the preliminary period, so stop thinking about useless things. Letho calmed down and held the note that was on his knee. Tell me, do you feel any change in your body? The first time should bring some benefit with it. Change? Roy put his fantasies aside and looked at his character sheet. HP, 3055. Poisoned. Damn. I lost 20 points. That's one poisonous potion. Compared to that, Berbercane fruits and blowballs were nothing. When he looked down, he arched his eyebrow, for he saw his will had gone up to six points, a point two point increase. Well, that was one hell of a painful experience, so this is normal, but it's probably limited to the first time. There was nothing else aside from that. Could the lack of change be because of my body being better than an average adult's? He thought he'd have a skill related to poison. Was the potion insufficient? Well, there is some change, he said. I can feel my will and thinking becoming stronger. I see. Letho looked disappointed. I came up with the same result after the checkup. Maybe it's because of your age, but it doesn't matter. The final results will only be known after the first phase. After Roy had rested for two days and recovered from his ordeal, he was ready to leave Aldersburg with Letho. He didn't plan on going to the house of Cardell to say goodbye, since it would only make everyone sad. Then Seville came. He went up to them, laughing heartily. Obviously his life had been happy as of late, and his beard was well trimmed, and his hair slick. He looked energetic, the traces of his insomnia nowhere to be found. Seville held Roy's and Letho's hands at the same time, with his own hairy ones, looking like he was reunited with his long-lost family. Thanks to your help, I now have no worries. You must pay me a visit when you come back to Aldersburg. I shall receive you with open arms. Roy waved him away dismissively. He'd already profited a lot from the delivery request. Then Seville said, Since you and Letho are going west, you'll have to get through the Mahakam soon, but heretics have been causing trouble in the mountains, and the Elder has set traps along the way. Going there without anything would be troublesome, but I will not let my friends get into trouble. Here, a letter of safe conduct. Take it, and you should get through easily. They show that much respect to me there. He then winked at Roy, and the boy took the letter, though he felt nervous. Do you ha- be a goal of some sort, Seville? He thought the wink was suspicious. Oh, of course not. I am not an ungrateful dwarf. I shall never trick my friends. Roy calmed down a bit after Seville's multiple reassurances, and he read the letter. My brethren in the Mahakams, the people before you come from the Viper School, and they are skillful, distinguished witchers who have helped me a lot in Aldersburg. They are now good friends of mine, so please show them the kindness and respect they deserve and grant them passage through the Mahakam Mountains. Love, your brother, the Squirrel of Mahakam, Seville Hoger, November 1260. Oh, it's just a simple letter asking for safe passage for us. Roy stopped getting hung up on that matter, and he hesitated for a moment before telling Seville his request. He wanted him to take care of the people of the House of Cardell. Seville agreed to it. Not long after, Letho and Roy finished packing and rested their eyes. There wasn't much to pack. Most were just Roy's clothes, potions, and alchemy tools. 
Two bags and a saddlebag were enough. If this were in the past, there wouldn't have been so many clothes. Letho would have gone around alone. The wilds were remote, and going for weeks without a bath was normal. He'd just take one at an inn once two weeks had passed, then he'd share a fun night with a woman. For the most part, he was just like the sailors, coachmen, and bodyguards, the lowest echelon of society. However, Roy was a lot more particular, so he took a lot of baths to prepare for the future, though that made Letho slightly uneasy. As they talked, Letho and Roy left Aldersburg and walked west, where the Mahakam stood. Chapter 49 Blood in the Mountains When night fell, a bright full moon hung in the sky, and its light shone on a face filled with terror. The face was full of stubble the length of fingernails, its skin flabby, bloated, and drenched in sweat. It had dark circles and eyes as big as tennis balls, though they were bloodshot, and the man looked around him frantically. His yellow hemp shirt was tucked in his pants, caked in mud, black soot, and ore remnants. His tight pants were in tatters because of the sharp branches in the forest, and two holes were on his knees, while crimson liquid stuck to them. At that moment, he was backing up against the thick pine tree, his hands on his knees as he panted heavily. His fingers, blackened by soot, were trembling reflexively, but he gripped his pants until his fingers were white in an attempt to stop his fear. Bang, bang, bang. Then, loud footsteps boomed through the forest, and the ground trembled, leaves falling from branches. He covered his mouth with both hands in fear, curling up like a millipede. He hid behind the big tree, holding in his breath and listening to his surroundings closely. Every rumble sent fear up to his mind, making his body tremble reflexively. He held down on his nose and mouth even stronger, almost suffocating himself. He was reminded of a scene of extreme horror, and his eyes gleamed in fear. A long, melancholic sigh flew across the forest, and the rumble stopped five seconds after that, but for the man, it felt like an eternity. Eventually, it went farther and farther, until the man couldn't hear it anymore. He plopped down onto the ground, his chest heaving. He was like a fish out of water, and he gasped for air, for he'd almost died from asphyxiation. Then tears fell down his cheeks. I managed to get out of that somehow. Tina, Jim, I'm coming back tomorrow, and then we're leaving this place. Wait for me. Wait for Daddy, he mumbled to himself, and his eyes that were filled with despair slowly had the gleam of life and hope with them. But quietly, a vine as thick as an arm slowly moved down the rubber tree behind the man, not unlike a viper stalking its prey. Eventually, it approached the man's head, and it lifted itself up, just like how a viper would. Then it coiled, storing energy. A moment later, it pounced on the man, wrapping around him, pulling him ten feet off the ground. The man's face turned red, and he frantically grabbed at the vine that was tightening around him, blood pouring from his mouth, and he kicked the air as if he were spasming. But it was for naught. He was lifted high up and pulled back. Everything became a blur, and all he could see was green fern growing in the middle of the air between legs that were as thick as trunks. And then he went limp, just like a popped balloon. A few branch-like creatures stabbed his body, and along with the eerie voice they made, hot liquid spurted out, just like a fountain, and that was the end of his life. The man's face was drained of all color in an instant, and he murmured something as his death throes. He kicked the air and stopped breathing, forever. A pale body was pierced by multiple branches, pinning him ten feet above the ground. As the moonlight shone on it, pieces of bloody entrails slid down the stomach, swinging with the chilly wind of the night. As the blood dripped onto the earth, it was greedily absorbed, and a sigh of satisfaction was heard in the dark. Roy let out a sigh and got up to straighten his wrinkled clothes, dusting off the leaves and stems from him. He was drenched in sweat. Had a nightmare? Letho tossed a few handfuls of soil into the campfire, dowsing the fire, then handed Roy a hot rabbit drumstick. It felt like someone was throttling me, and I couldn't breathe. Roy chomped down on the meat and wiped the grease off his lips. He tried to convince himself. Maybe my body's telling me to watch out because it's getting cold, but that was the first time I'd had a dream since I'd started replacing sleep with meditation, and it was a nightmare. H, he frowned. Fate works in mysterious ways. Sometimes it'll give us clues in the form of dreams. This isn't a good sign. 
Finish your meal quickly, boy. Letho looked at the mountain covered in snow that was not far from them. We have to pass through the Mahakams as soon as possible. I hope nothing else happens then. They journeyed on for a few more hours and came to the base of the mountains after passing through the West Path. When they looked up, the peak was already hidden by the clouds and snow. Before them stood trees that had been brought low by the autumn winds, their branches swaying and their leaves falling to the ground. A boy in a blue cotton jacket was hopping around the forest like a bunny, scavenging for resources. Roy and Letho were about to ask him for directions when a sturdy woman darted out from the forest to pick up the boy and turn him upside down to spank him. Running around again? What if you get eaten by the monsters? I should wallop you before that happens. The boy bawled, much to the amusement of Letho and Roy. Ma'am, is this the way to the Mahakams? Who are you? I've never seen you two before. The woman glanced at them and brought her guard up when she noticed they were strangers. She held the crying boy in her embrace nervously, as if she were facing two terrifying monsters. We're not human traffickers, ma'am. No need to be afraid. Roy smiled warmly, though the corner of his lips twitched. I look normal, and the girls from the House of Cardell liked me. I'm not that scary, am I? The woman said nothing, only staring fearfully at the bald witcher behind him. Roy looked back and realized the reason for the woman's fear. He mumbled, Poker face, weird eyes, looks cold. No wonder she's scared. He then turned back to explain. Have you heard of witchers, ma'am? We have to look fierce or we can't hunt those monsters. Don't worry, though, since we're just going to ask for directions. We'll leave after that. Your witchers? The woman observed them in suspicion, then she scrambled away with the boy in hand. She looked back at them on the way and almost tripped on a stone, but she didn't fall. Her child gurgled happily. Don't leave. They looked at each other, confused, then tailed the woman. They walked across the pine forest and saw white smoke coming from the chimneys of the houses in a village. Under the signboard with the name Svanthor carved on it stood a red-nosed man wearing a felt hat, and a few village women were behind him. Children were hiding behind the women, though they looked at the two people who came to their village curiously. The man with the felt hat glanced at the snake-shaped necklace hanging around Letho's neck, and he rubbed his hands and forced a warm smile. Why don't you stay for a meal if you have the time? We have a request for you. Please, come with us. Chapter 50 The Dead Miner Svanthor was located at the base of the Mahakam Mountains, and there were less than 200 families there. Most of the youths didn't work in the fields, but instead became miners in the mountains the dwarves developed. It had been that way for more than fifty years. Instead of using wood for their houses, the village's buildings were made out of oars, making them sturdy and prettier. Roy sat on the rug in the chief's house, pray drinking a bowl of vegetable soup made out of shriveled vegetables, and he rubbed his chin, being a witcher's lucrative. We just left Aldersburg, and already we're receiving a request. We haven't even rested enough yet. Mr. Casillas, as you were saying, there have been four deaths during the last three months. The man with the red nose nodded solemnly. Three single lads died a bit ago, and the latest casualty is Brady. It's been a few days since we've found his body. Two children and his wife survive him. Since their breadwinner is gone, they can only live on welfare from now on. He sighed. Ever since the village's inception, it has been more than twenty years since the last murder of such brutality. Everyone's really scared, and they say the murderers are monsters in the mountains. They're worried they might be next, so I beseech you, please find out who or what did this. The bounty is negotiable. Letho waved him down. That can wait. We need more information. Why is there only women, children, and the elderly when we came? Where are the men? Casillas pointed at the sun outside. Everyone's still working in the mines now, there's still four or five hours until their return. Roy gasped. They're working instead of taking care of their families even after the murders have happened? Aren't they worried they might be the next victims? Casillas rubbed his nose and smiled bitterly. Nothing we can do. I've told their boss in the Mahakams about this, and the working hours have been reduced so they can return before dark. Also, they promised they'd catch the murderer, but they aren't professionals, and it's been three months since then, 
but there's been no progress, so we have to rely on witchers for the job now. He looked at them, his gaze expectant but careful. Their boss in Mahakam? Roy thought about that, and he found it curious. As far as he knew, dwarves, elves, and the other ancient species were inferior in status to humans in the current society, but the positions seemed to be switched in the Mahakams. The humans working in the mines called the dwarves their boss. He could feel the fear and respect Cassius radiated at the mention of the dwarves. Is Brovar Hoger a tyrant? Letho took control of the conversation and cut to the chase. Let's talk about the meat of the matter. We need to understand the rough details of the deaths, like the cause. Cassius answered in anger. As the village chief, I went there as fast as I could, and what I saw was, and still is, horrifying. I could never forget it. The monsters are nothing but cruel bastards. Cassius told them what he'd observed, and Letho and Roy fell into silent ponderance. They died in the forest, their stomachs sliced open, their bodies pierced by a wooden thing, fastening them to the ground, and their bodies were left to be feasted on by birds and beasts. Letho gave Roy a look, and Roy understood what he was trying to say, so he spoke of his judgment. According to your testimony, I am almost certain that they weren't killed by monsters unlike what the villagers told you. In most cases, monsters wouldn't run around to hurt people. They hate open places like forests in mountains. Most prefer lying in dark and cramped places like graves. What you spoke of sounded more like an ancient ritual. We need more clues. We need to check the bodies. Roy gazed at Cassius, and it took the chief a while to snap out of it. If it wasn't a monster, then what was it? He gave them an apologetic look. Also, it's impossible to check the bodies now. Everyone burned them because they were worried the lads might have at. He turned into ghouls from being infected by the monsters. I, it's desecrating the dead, but we had no choice. It was for everyone's survival. Wait, who told you monsters can infect people? It's not a plague or disease. No way can it spread. It's going to be hard to go on now, since you burned the bodies. Cassius couldn't find any comeback for that. Who told you the monsters were the murderers in the first place? The lords of the mountain. Roy thought about it quietly, while Letho clapped and stood up. It's normal for them to know nothing about monsters. Don't scold them, boy. Mr. Cassius, why don't you take us around the village so we can get more clues? What about the request? We'll have to investigate further to see if we can take this. The moment they exited, the women and children who were listening averted their gazes in fright and pretended to be busy, though they looked clumsy. Roy noticed Letho's stern look and realized that the request might be a hard one. Is this a hard one, Letho? I didn't think you'd refuse it. Boy, I told you to never take requests that are beyond what you can do. That message is all the more important for people like you who think they can do anything because they learned something, Letho emphasized. First, know who your enemies are, or you might just die a horrible death. They were led to Brady's house by Cassius. Brady was the latest casualty. A woman with a red face and plain clothes was waiting outside for them. After Letho introduced himself, he asked, Had your husband been acting strange before his death? Or had he left any special messages for you? The woman pondered in sorrow and shook her head dumbly. What about your husband's reputation in the village then? How is it? His reputation has always been good. He'd be the first to help no matter who was in trouble. And aside from working in the mines, he was a great hunter. Whenever he hunted something, he'd share it with everyone. Cassius added, I can be a witness to that. Her husband's reputation is fine. The three lads who died had some grudges against the villagers, but Brady was a gentle man who never argued with anyone. Everyone liked him. At the mention of that, the woman was reminded of her husband's kindness, and she buried her face in her hands to cry. H. He stayed in the mines for half a month. I never expected that to be our last goodbye. I, I didn't even manage to keep his body. As she cried, two chubby children darted out from behind her and hugged her legs. Then they cried with her. Poor Tina and Jim. They lost their father at such a young age. The kids are just five. How can they survive after this? Cassius patted the boy's head, and the boy looked up. He wiped his tears away with his dirty hands and stared at Roy with watering eyes. You will get the murderer, won't you? 
His sister and mother looked at him with hopeful gazes. Roy glanced at Letho, but he was still inscrutable, as always. Roy took a deep breath and calmed the stirring in his heart, then he looked away from the boy who was crying. Let's go to the other victims' homes, Mr. Casillas. Do the villagers usually stay out that long? Roy asked. Only Brady. He wanted to make some money to send Jim to a school in Aldersburg. I see. The visits went smoothly. The remaining victims didn't have any complex relationships within the village. Even though they did fight with the other villagers, it didn't warrant murder. Letho didn't even need to use Axie to find what he wanted. Roy also had a feeling that the one behind the murders wasn't a human. Take us to the latest crime scene, Letho said.